Yeah, just took the studio to create was the universally available infrastructure that would free humans to be connected to any place. Yet here they are still alienated, and the extreme conditions are not part of one experience of immersion and logic. In order to approach the link in between, I would like to take a closer look at the spatial phenomenon atmosphere and how it settles in our awareness. Based on Husserl's Schau and further phenomenological investigations, Herbert uh, Spiegelberg's The Phenomenological Method outlines a helpful framework of contemplative introspective steps to approach phenomena in our actual experience. Atmosphere is one of these. There's there's no architectural space without an atmosphere. Our moods change accordingly. We are touched and tuned, stimulated and comforted. We have countless adjectives to describe them. Sublime, serene, tense, mystic, casual, uplifting. Although our body does not have a specific organ for sensing atmospheres, we still seem to be able to perceive them. We have an awareness of our body being in them that differs from a purely physical presence and equally introduces a more complete sensual and intellectual immersion. Like the phenomenon light that, despite broad scientific and empirical knowledge of its physical consistency, still needs a phenomenological handling to make it a poetic element in design projects. The phenomenon that will be intuited here is not one specific atmosphere, for example the sublime um, things that we will hear about later, but an approach towards general essences that are consistent to all atmospheric experiences. In the first step of phenomenological intuiting, the object is intuited with utter concentration, without becoming absorbed to the point of no longer looking critically. Imagine a moment with a strong atmospheric experience, for example, a licensed weather project or uh, something local, Rio RNG. Um, we immerse into something that feels pure and distilled. It moves and inspires by its intensity and challenges both emotional and intellectual reactions. And then there's these moments with overwhelmingly cacophonic impressions where lots of events happen simultaneously, less inspiring for introspection, but seducing to get carried away in a continuous flow of distraction, just like Benjamin's Flaneur. What do these experiences have in common? We are engaged with our environment emotionally and sensually, Yet while these reactions happen introspectively, they are triggered by something we immerse into, outside the self. The second step of the method is called investigating general essences. Deducing from the previously intuited, intuited the phenomenon emerges through bodily and emotional presence and, if the intensit intensity is right, challenges empathetic involvement. Without investigating further on this, it seems to be here where the atmospheric has a strong potential in challenging empathy that leads to a participative awareness and ultimately activism. And uh, I think we, I could have put up a, that um, Liebeskind's um, museum in Berlin, you know, that's where you saw a Liebeskind project on the screen, um, which also translates very well something unspeakable into a concept of voids. And we heard today, okay, maybe that wasn't how it delineated it, but at the end it was at the center of, of the experience. Um, and also uh, referring to the second lecture, the uh, second key uh, keynote lecture yesterday, um, while for example um, aspects of ecolo ecological architecture are always solved technically, I, I haven't seen um, buildings that address uh, the heart in that sense, as we heard yesterday. Um, and I think if, if, if that was challenged, at least as a designer, it's something I want to t think about. Uh, would that lead maybe to be more involved into these questions and lead actually to activism? Another general essence addresses what Mark Wickley calls a climate of sensually perceivable emissions such as light, sound, temperature, and humidity. All of these effects affect us concurrently. When we talk about atmospheres, we use words like environment, climate, aura, and ambience, and mood. These terms have their strength in their ethereal imprecision. They insinuate that a lot of things occur at the same time. 
the tension in the linguistic origin of the term atmosphere is reflected here. The Greek atmos, meaning a vaporizing substance that is wildly kin kinetic, is attempted to be contained and spatially defined as a sphere of gas. So one of the atmospheric's main es essences is thus its constituency as a sum or sphere of multiple, often uncontrollable, effects. The third step is apprehending essential relationships. <coughs> when perceiving atmospheres, we tend to fade away when focusing on one of the effects only, rather than how they appear together. For example, in Agnes Martin's painting, the focus on the lines dissolves the overall atmospheric experience. The muller lyer optical illusion demonstrates how the effect of being suspended in the questioning of the length of the two lines disappears when focusing on only one of them. Simultaneously, Uta Bart's photography ground enables the immersion into the simultaneous perception of different spatial incidents. The background takes most of the surface of the image and is represented out of focus, yet the small detail in the foreground is sharp. The experience of the image becomes suspended in the perceptual field in between. Yet focusing on either the foreground or background only dissolves the atmospheric effect in between. This is familiar with Heidegger's description of the work of art as an ongoing conflict between clearing and double concealment as the battleground, which is an open field that can be approached and experienced rather than looked at only. Martin's pencil drawing consists in fine hand-drawn lines. The lines are not precise but set up a shimmering and flickering that will become the velvety impression. While the grid, the square format, and the use of repetition are the framework um, that opens up the battleground, it is the imperfect character of the pencil lines that triggers the atmospheric experience. Martin balances an open field, the grid, with the more seductive element, the imperfect lines. In his essay, Atmospheres, Peter Zumthor talks, Peter Zumthor talks about this balance, this balance between seducing and offering openness in architecture. He calls it the tension between composure and seduction. The quality of an atmosphere seems thus dependent on the relationship between strong atmospheric stimuli and an open stage that invites to be appropriated. The next step, watching modes of appearing, examines how phenomena look like rather than feel like. The material causes of the effects are concealed. What is being perceived is the aura in between. This could be compared to the reflection of a light in a mirror. The actual light source becomes invisible, and only the reflection of what is being emitted, the light, is perceivable. While the effects are visceral and penetrate the senses, the sources for the effects are experienced in a distance. When shifting one's concentration on a source, the experience of the overall effect is corrupted. As a result, the sum of the effect, the sum of the effect appears clear in their atmospheric appearance, but they are unclear in revealing the causes. The fifth step explores the constitution of phenomena in consciousness. Referring to the suspended blurred per perception just described, it seems that the mind has to be kind of out of focus, I would say, distracted. In his work of art essay, Benjamin called the distracted mode of perception the authentic architectural perception. Um, this way of perceiving architecture, I don't think is treated very much um, currently, at least not in the, in the mainstream media, as we are talking mostly about the other part in um, Benjamin's article about the concentrated perception of an oratic object. Um, further, there's a sequential character inherent to the phenomenon. In the progression of different, different cognitive states, we first perceive viscerally, then we become recep receptive about how we are emotionally affected, and then we grow cognitive of the constituency of the effects. Kant describes a similar sequence of experience and pleasure in the sublime. There, a feeling of sheer magnitude and helplessness in face of nature 
is associated with a feeling of displeasure. This is followed by a state of independence and superiority over nature by power of reason. The experience of the atmospheric reflects this process from visceral affection to cognition. The last step, suspending belief in existence and interp interpreting concealed meaning, can be treated less extensively in this context. There, um, there uh, are more hermeneutic in tradition. As the subject is reached emotionally before being cognitive and in control of its uh, response, it is seducible and vulnerable. Here lies the ground for the common critique of the atmospheric as being a tool of political power and economic manipulation. Paradoxically, this same emotional immersion empowers the positive potential to be authentically connected to one's environment. In the following, I would like to make a quick walk through a methodology that we applied for the uh, before mentioned thesis work. At first, we had approached an interdisciplinary research, uh, in an interdisciplinary research, the material needs of hospices, hospices inhabitants. At the entry, for example, the building has to address fragile emotions like despair, hope, and dignity. The findings were collected in a reader that followed both for linear narrative and fragmented reading as a dictionary, which became then handy in the design process as you obviously could always refer to certain aspects, but you always always had the, the whole picture in mind. The research led to the formulation of a working hypothesis and applicable thesis and sub -thesis and so on. In order to make the transition from the literal, literal narrative of the reader to the spatial object, we wrote a storyboard for the key inhabitants of the building. Then a collection of vignettes of key moments gave spatial illusions, and here's one of them. Uh, for example, concerning the scene of farewell, this is the scene where you basically load the catafalque on the car and then drive it away. Uh, concerning the scene of farewell, it, has, it was important that the house would not be stigmatized by the image of the mortuary van only, but rather by its spirit of liveliness. Yet the situation also required that the boarding of the catafalque did not take place in, in a situation that felt closed away, but naturally as part of daily life. Hence, a dignified way of boarding is present to street life, yet far enough to respect the intimacy of the families. The passers-by will experience the simultaneity of this specific moment uh, on the right, and the common scene of children playing in a childcare environment, while both of them have no visual, visual connection in between. And this is being done uh, already in some hospices, hospices, not in that superposition, but to have childcare in um, hospices in some uh, hospices in uh, Britain. Only after these key moments have been designed, we conceptualize the house in its entirety. It is therefore rather defined by its spatial relations and the inf interfaces in between. For example, the juxtaposition of the living room and the patient room and the refinement of the articulation of the threshold in between. The house was envisioned to have an open character for personal appropriation by each inhabitant, but also over time by all inhabitants all to, uh, together. Yet also it had moments of strength, strong atmospheric definition, such as the rotating table and the niche in the room. This reflects the aspect of openness and seduction discussed previously. The described methodology was set up so to create a, trans a transition between the literal and the spatially formal without restricting either, yet guaranteeing consistency of intent. As a result, the house is rather a prosthesis, an extension of the self that can be appropriated than an inhabitable object, even if, by definition, a hospice is an institutional building. The above approach to understanding the atmospheric provides access to the in-between, to intangible and unrepresentative phenomena that also relate with human sentiments in the process of learning how the effects cause the affects. Dealing with true emotions, this process bears authenticity about our awareness of reality. Emotional involvement and empathetic participation of the subject mean an end to an art form that is aimed at distance, 
And I think here lies the social potential of the atmosphere. Uh, yesterday, after the in-between section, we heard a discussion about the question of newness and difference in interpreting Japanese and Western space concepts. So what is new here? I don't think anything about the understanding of space, but uh, about a shift in awareness in the application of atmosphere.